If you struggle with your buoyancy while diving, you are not alone. Buoyancy control is one of those things that you will always be working on as a diver throughout your entire diving career or diving life, but it does get easier over time. In this video, I'll cover the fundamental things you need to focus on to finally improve your buoyancy and your overall diving experience. We'll start with why you should even care about your buoyancy and then jump right into the actual steps on improving your buoyancy and the things you need to do and focus on. Finally, I saved a special tool that I wrote for you near the end of the video, so make sure you stick around to check that out. With that, let's get into it. I'm Thomas Hughes, a professional scuba instructor, and on this channel, you'll see videos on scuba education, equipment, experiences, and environmental awareness. Now, if you're a newer diver, you might be wondering why good buoyancy control even matters that much. Like, isn't it just good enough for me to be able to float underwater and sink and, and that's it? And if you're a more experienced diver, then you should probably watch this too, because a lot of experienced divers, unfortunately, never really learned the core fundamentals properly. And because of this, their buoyancy might be, you know, pretty good or get to a certain point, but they might still have some other issues that we'll talk about here with things like trim and, and other items like that. Good buoyancy control affects so many areas of your diving. First and foremost, it should go without saying that staying off of the bottom so you don't damage sensitive marine life, like coral reefs, for example, is just something that every diver has to do. Like, there's no question about it. You can't be banging into the bottom, kicking corals and things like that. You are not going to be allowed to continue diving uh, with any type of operator if they see you doing that sort of thing and you have, you know, no control at all over your buoyancy. But with proper control and technique, if you do have your buoyancy locked in, you can be that diver that seems to just effortlessly hover, you know, maybe even a few inches off the coral reef instead, whether they're you know going in with a camera to do a little macro shot, or maybe they just want to hover above and check out some of the you know smaller marine life that's there and just get a lot closer look. You know, if you don't have good buoyancy control, you probably don't feel comfortable getting that close to the reef because you don't want to damage it and you don't want to use your hands and push off of it or anything like that because the oils in our fingers will damage the reef as well. So having very good buoyancy control and proper propulsion, which we'll talk about a little bit as well, is going to be something that you really need in order to do that kind of hover or you know, cruising right above the reef, for example. Next, your air consumption will improve tremendously. So if you think about it, the more streamlined you are, the more in trim, and the more efficient you are as you move through the water, the less air you're gonna be consuming. And then also, as we make small adjustments to our BCD, we're using gas out of our tank. So if you're constantly kind of adding a few puffs, then releasing air, and then adding puffs and releasing air, well, that's because your buoyancy is off and you're not, you know, doing things properly. So you're actually using a lot more gas doing that. If we're way more efficient in the water, we're going to use less air. And it's something that we're always working on as divers, but especially as new divers, air consumption usually is something we're a little self-conscious about and having proper buoyancy control is going to help you with your air consumption as a side effect. Now, all of these things combined add up to just a better overall experience while diving, whether that's so you can check out things a little bit easier, you can move through the water more efficiently and stay underwater longer because of your air consumption being increased as well. So with that all said, let's talk about how we can actually get our buoyancy in check and how we can get a better control over our buoyancy. So what are the steps? Well, first and foremost, you need to have the right mindset and just understanding that buoyancy is, again, something that you're always going to be working on to some extent, and it's never going to be, you know, 100% exactly perfect. It's something that you'll probably always have to make little tweaks to is really the right approach that you need to start with as you go into this whole buoyancy workshop, I guess, or, you know, this kind of buoyancy practice that we're going to talk about. The reason for this is that our body's composition changes day by day, so our buoyancy changes day by day. Just like, you know, we can eat a, a really big meal in the morning or at night before you know, we went to bed and then we wake up and go diving, uh, or maybe we've been fasting for a while instead and we don't have that big meal in our stomach. Like, that can change the weight on the scale by quite a bit, and similarly, it can change the way our body is in the water with our buoyancy. So that's why they say, you know, if it's been a little while since you've been diving, make sure you do a proper weight check, which we'll talk about just a second here because your body composition might have changed. It could be a little bit more muscle, a little less muscle, a little more fat, a little less fat. Maybe uh, depending on your age, you had a little bit of a growth spurt or something like that, right? And those types of changes mean that you actually need to um, kind of go through this process of, of getting your buoyancy fine-tuned again. Another aspect that's going to be changing, maybe not as often or as commonly, but it still does change, is going to be our gear configuration and especially our exposure protection. So gear configuration-wise, let's say you don't own your own equipment yet, so you're renting gear. Uh, one of the benefits of, of owning equipment is that you can kind of know your equipment better for buoyancy, for example, and, and things like weight placement, which we'll talk about as well. Uh, but if you are like renting gear, then every time you rent a different piece of equipment, you know, that material 
could be a little older, a little bit newer, could be a different size or something like that. And the buoyancy characteristics will change a little bit. You know, overall they should be fairly similar, but it does change. Uh, another thing that changes things quite a bit actually is gonna be the size of your tank and also the material the tank's made out of. So an aluminum tank versus a steel tank, for example. And then if you have uh, aluminum 80s versus aluminum 100s or, you know, steel 80s versus steel 100s or, you know, other sizes too that are a little less common for recreational divers, but something that you'll still see. So, you know, tank size and uh, material is gonna change quite a bit for your buoyancy as well. And then again, like I said, most importantly, it's probably gonna be that exposure protection because your exposure protection, AKA like the wetsuit or dry suit that you're wearing, those will actually change buoyancy characteristics over time. So even if I'm using the same five mil wetsuit that I'm always using in colder water, that five mil wetsuit over time, due to compression as we go underwater, will slowly lose its buoyancy and lose its thermal properties as well, actually. So, you know, basically you'll see sometimes like an old rental wetsuit that is a five mil, but it's really acting kind of like a three mil in terms of warmth. And that's because those two millimeters of compression have happened uh, just over the years. You know, the wetsuit's seen a lot of use, a lot of time underwater, and it's just not as buoyant anymore. And it doesn't have as many little air pockets in it to help you with thermal properties either. So, you know, Bottom line is that gear configuration changes to include exposure protection, tanks, etc., will change your buoyancy. And it's something to keep in mind that again, you know, we're gonna be constantly tweaking things and we need to work on this a little bit every time we go diving. Now, because these things do change our buoyancy, it's one of the reasons why I mentioned earlier that a proper weight check is always recommended before you start diving. So ideally, sure, every single time you're about to go on a dive, we can do a weight check, but at least at like the start of your week, if you're going on a dive trip, for example, and especially if it's been a while since you've been diving, because that's more likely to have some sort of body composition change. Now I'll get into how you can estimate like how much weight to start with before you do your weight check so you can kind of, you know, get it as close as possible and then make those fine tune adjustments. But let's just go ahead and talk about the weight check for now and I'll get into the estimating a little bit later. Once you have the amount of weight that you want to start with in your weight pockets, on a weight belt, in trim pockets, you know, wherever you might have it on your body, go ahead and put all of your equipment on and go out into the water in water that's too deep to stand. So ideally, if you're going to be doing some dives with a dive operator, with a boat, maybe you can do a little shore entry dive to get out in the water, for example. Uh, or if you're gonna be out in a lake or quarry, kind of stay near the dock if possible, because this will allow you to easily swap weights out if need be. Once you're in that water too deep to stand, you're gonna go ahead and float vertically. So just kind of hanging up and down. Uh, and you're going to go ahead and start letting air out of your BCD. So go ahead and start releasing that air from it. And you'll start to go ahead and sink down. As you start to deflate, make sure that you are hanging completely motionless as well. So just completely uh, deflate the BCD until it's completely empty. No more air is coming out. And just as your head's about to start dipping down, I want you to take a normal breath and hold it. It's the only time I'm going to tell you to hold your breath in diving. So with that regulator in, take a breath in, hold it and you should float right around eye level. Now, when I say a normal breath, I, I don't mean a big, deep <sighs> breath, or you know, where you're completely full in your lungs up. What I mean is just a normal breath as if you weren't thinking about it at all and you just had to have that normal rhythm of <sighs> <sighs> Right, so just kind of a normal breath in and then hold it. <clears throat> it should be about 50% of your lung capacity at that point. Now that other key component here is gonna to be to remain completely motionless. So no sculling with your hands, no kicking with your feet. You know, it's, it's actually very common. It's one of those things that like a natural reaction when we're at the surface is for us to just kind of move our legs a little bit. But any type of movement like that is gonna actually add to our buoyancy and help us stay afloat. So we won't be able to do a proper weight check unless we are literally just hanging there, motionless, not doing anything, deflate, <sighs> Hold the breath and we should float right at eye level. Now, if you are able to hold your breath, again, just a normal breath and you're floating at eye level, go ahead and exhale, just do a complete and try to dump the, uh, the lung as quickly as possible. You might even wanna almost do like a coughing type sound through your regulator to just quickly exhale. You should start to sink. And when I say sink, I mean more of like a drift or float downward, right? So again, stay motionless. You should start drifting and slowly sinking uh, as you exhale there, but not fall like a rock, right? If you're sinking too quickly, then you are overweighted and we wanna take some weight off. Uh, if you exhale and you aren't able to go down at all, then we might need to add one pound or maybe you know one, one or two kilos. Um, but we definitely don't wanna like just add lots and lots of weight. And this is why having a buddy help you and or being close to the dock or close to the boat is gonna be really good as you do this weight check because you can just easily swap weights in and out and kind of get that perfect weighting for you. Now, once you've gotten to the point that a normal breath and completely deflated BCD, complete motionless, just hovering there in the water, it leaves you floating right at eye level and then exhaling allows you to sink slowly. Then you wanna go ahead and kick back up to the surface, inflate, 
And then you want to add about four to five pounds or about two kilos to your overall weight. If you're using a completely full tank, which I assume you are for this because I never told you otherwise. So if your tank is completely full, it's full of gas that has been used yet. And that gas does have weight to it, right? So if you think about diving and near the end of our dive, we might be at maybe 500 PSI or like 20 to 30 bar remaining in our tank, uh, then we need to account for the amount of gas that we've used up that is now lightening our tank. And this is why people say things like an aluminum tank will be floaty near the end of a dive, right? So to accommodate for that floatiness, we wanna add four to five pounds or two kilos roughly uh, of extra weight when we do that weight check. So, um, you know, depending on what you're doing, you might be able to do a weight check at the end of your dive as well. And, and that would be ideal. Um, you know, it'd be great if you can do a weight check with a, a near empty tank instead, because, you know, we, we basically want to be able to stay under and hold our safety stop or our decompression stop, which is why we have to add a little bit of weight here. But we don't want to be so overly heavy that we're just sinking down to the bottom. So, you know, different characteristics of your tank, like if you're using a steel tank instead, uh, steel tanks do have buoyancy properties to them as well, but the weight of the tank usually offsets that's the amount of gas that you're using uh, inside of a standard steel tank. So, you know, you don't have to necessarily like add extra weight usually if you're using a steel tank. Sometimes you might even be able to use a little less weight than what you normally would. So just from uh, some food for thought there. Now to kind of wrap up this proper weighting section, which is really like the linchpin of buoyancy to start with is having proper weighting. Uh, there's a few other tips that you want to keep in mind too. So first of all, the salinity of the water or whether it's salt water or fresh water and how salty the water is basically is going to change the buoyancy of it. So fresh water is less buoyant than salt water, which means that you need more weight when you're in salt water. You might need to add a couple pounds or you know a kilo or two. It just kind of depends on your body itself and you're gonna have to do a weight check for that. But salt water isn't all the same to where you are in the world. So if you're down in the Caribbean versus somewhere like the Red Sea, for example, the Red Sea is known to have a much higher salinity level or much more salt in the salt water. Uh, so that actually means that the water is going to make you more buoyant. And then just remember to reiterate that uh, you do need to adjust your weighting, even if you're using the same wetsuit for a long period of time, because that wetsuit will become less buoyant over time as the uh, compression effect just basically, you know, crushes some of those bubbles in the neoprene. And again, over time, it won't become as buoyant. Uh, I should also mention that there are some uh, materials out there that are said to be basically neutrally buoyant now. So things like bare exoware or shark skin, for example, uh, they give you thermic properties like three millimeter or five millimeter, depending on the, the uh, one that that you buy, uh, but they're also supposed to be like neutrally buoyant. So it shouldn't change your buoyancy at all to have that uh, or not in a significant way that you actually need to change the amount of lead that you're taking with you, which is great. Now, once you have the amount of weight correct, we aren't done yet. Again, starting with proper weighting is definitely the linchpin. It's the, the starting point to proper buoyancy control. And if you don't get this right, then nothing else really matters. But now that we have the right amount of weight, we need to move it around our body properly. If you think about it, if all of your weights in one spot on your body, like let's just say it's all in your weight pockets on a jacket style BCD, for example, all that weight's gonna be shifting your center of gravity, which is actually gonna put you out of trim. And if you aren't familiar with the term, trim refers to the basically tilt of your body within the water. So for example, if you're rolling a little bit left or a little bit right, then maybe you have a little bit more weight on the left side of your body or right side of your body, which shifted your center of gravity. So if you're not kicking, you're not moving, you're not doing anything at all, you should be able to float perfectly parallel to the ground. Uh, and ideally, actually, you'd have your, your knees bent with your legs up, a little bit above your torso. So arms out, flat, knees back and bent basically. So your legs are, are up above you here. And that's kind of like perfect trim position, right? So if all of your weight is down in your weight pockets or on a weight belt, then you might be sagging a little bit. And you know, your legs, instead of being up above you, they might be actually hanging a little bit below you. Uh, if your legs are a little too floaty and you find yourself really head down, then maybe you wanna have a little bit of heavier fins, for example, or maybe move some of that weight further down. And vice versa, if you do have all that weight down low and you're kind of uh, dipping down, I guess, where your legs are dropping a little bit more, then you might either need a little bit of lighter fins or maybe we just need to move some of that weight up higher, whether it's in trim pockets on the BC itself, or maybe like on the cam band, you can thread you know, a lead weight onto your, your tank strap itself, uh, or maybe even using like different clips and stuff like that, you can move that weight onto different D rings and move it up higher or lower on your BCD or your back plate. So, you know, really moving that weight around is gonna adjust your trim and you wanna get it to where you are perfectly flat and horizontal, parallel to the ground with your knees bent, again, arms forward, and just kind of stretching your arms more forward or back some should adjust kind of 
how you're tilted there, and it just requires a little bit of core strength to keep you uh, perfectly flat otherwise. The reason we want our knees bent with our legs up like that is it keeps our fins up away from the bottom. So if we are in either a tighter area, let's say like a, a shipwreck or inside of a cavern or cave, then we aren't kicking up sediment or anything like that. But even in open water, we might be down low close to a reef or down to a sandy bottom, and you don't wanna stir up and kick up all that sand there. So uh, one of the things you'll learn is uh, be able to do a frog kick instead, which kind of looks like this type of kick. Um, you know, and, and a frog kick, I'll, I'll have a, a video on propulsion that I'll talk about of, of different kicking methods uh, that I can link up in the cards and, and down below. But frog kicking is going to be like one of the most efficient ways to move through the water and allows you to go straight without changing your propulsion uh, to go like upwards or downwards at all, where flutter kicking technically um, can cause sediment to be stirred up because you're kind of throwing water force downward, I guess, against the sand. So you'll kick up sediment that way. But also if you aren't in that kind of bent position with your knees bent up and perfectly flat, there's a really good chance that that little bit of tilt up as you start kicking will send you upward. And that little bit of tilt down will send you downward. But we should be able to stay perfectly flat and not have to fight it or, you know, fin or anything like that to keep ourselves in position. So what I mean by that is we shouldn't be just relaxed and then start rolling to one side. We shouldn't be relaxed and then just start slowly tilting upward or slowly dipping our head down, right? And you probably know exactly what I mean if you've ever done this, like completely stop moving, stop doing everything, even maybe take a breath and hold it for just a second just so you don't keep going up and down. And you might see yourself just slowly going, oop, right? And then eventually you'll kind of hit a point where you just balance. Well, that means in, in my case, I was kind of dipping backwards and to my right. So I need to move more weight upward and a little bit to the left because that's gonna allow me to balance out that trim. So getting proper weight first is important, but then moving that weight to the right spot in your body is the next key element. Now, as you're doing this test, if you find that the normal inhalation exhalation that you're doing isn't enough to keep you from continuing to sink down or from floating up to the surface and you find yourself kind of struggling to like kick back down and then try to lock in position again, or you're kind of kicking up and then lock it in position, then you need to go back to the previous step and get your weighting correct again, because you are now overweighted, uh, depending on how deep you are. You know, Yes, if you go deep enough, you might need to add a puff or two to your BCD. It's a typical thing you learn in open water, but you probably haven't practiced properly. So get yourself neutrally buoyant, You know, either go back and do a weight check again, or if you know your weight's correct, then add a little puff to your BCD, get neutrally buoyant, so just normal inhalation, exhalation has a small rise, small fall, not taking deep, deep, deep breaths or completely dumping your lung just to try to stay in position. That shouldn't be happening. Now, the reason I mention this is because once you get that weight locked in and then you get the trim or the position of the weight locked in as well, it's all about breathing. And that's what we'll talk about now. Okay, so your BCD is a buoyancy compensator device. Buoyancy compensator. Unfortunately, a lot of divers, including even dive professionals, will mistakenly say the BCD stands for a buoyancy control device, which is completely inaccurate. It is not a buoyancy control device. You don't use it to control your buoyancy up and down. It is not an elevator, right? We don't mash that button when we want to go up and then dump real quickly when we want to go down, other than obviously like the initial descent, right? And then as we go back up, of course, we're going to be dumping a little bit of air potentially. But for the most part, we don't use our BCD to do anything but compensate for the amount of gas that we're breathing in our tank base. Basically, that's, that's really what it's mainly for. Now, instead, if we wanna go up and down in the water column, we should be using our internal BCs that all of us were born with and all of us have, and that's gonna be our lungs. Now, depending on things like the size of your lungs, which can change with age, gender, your body type, etc., you know, you may or may not have more or less lift than your dive buddy or another diver that's in the class with you or that you, you know, you're diving with, that type of thing. But in general, our lungs can actually provide all the way up to about 10 pounds of lift lift, which is quite a bit. You know, we, we have a lot of capacity there. And if you take a full deep breath, that's like filling your BCD, if you think about it, right? With a, a 10 pound lift wing, basically. Now with our normal breathing, so again, just kind of not really thinking about it, just casual inhale, exhale, we're gonna be doing possibly just a little bit of up and down motion in the water column as we're swimming along. And with practice, you can actually get that to a point where you don't go up and down at all and just kind of the normal breathing allows you to stay locked right in the middle there. Because basically what happens is as we take a deep full breath, we're going past that kind of normal point and we start to slowly rise, right? And then as we exhale, it takes a little bit to get back to that normal point, and then we drop below it, and that's where we start to actually descend again instead. So that's how we're gonna control our buoyancy. If we're approaching, let's say, a coral reef in front of us, and there's like a big barrel sponge that we have to get over, 
a little bit more deeper breath than you normally would. You start to rise. And then as you go past it and you want to go back down, dump that air and come back down. And you don't need to touch your BCD inflator hose at all, whether that's, you know, pulling a dump valve and, and dumping air out or hitting the inflate button and actually adding air to your wing. You don't need to do that at all. Now to practice your breath control after you've gotten everything else correct, I'd say just kind of do what you did in your open water class. So a really good way is if you do have an area that has training platforms, like my local quarry, for example, you can go in and lay flat on that training platform, add a little puff of air as you need to until you get to that neutral buoyancy. Once you're neutrally buoyant, just go ahead and play with your breath control and just kind of see if you can breathe in and start to rise and then catch it, exhale and, and start to drop. Um, you know, as you're just swimming around on every dive, really, if you're out in the ocean or anything like that, just kind of take some time to notice what you're doing. Inhale, exhale, and kind of be mindful of your breathing and see what that does to your buoyancy characteristics. Now, practice really does make perfect with this. And you'll probably hear this from anyone when you ask about like how you can improve your buoyancy and air consumption in general. And the first thing you're gonna say is like, just dive more, right? But it's not just diving more, it's actually going through these processes that I'm talking about and really taking the time. And, you know, I will say that that's where sometimes people do give classes like the peak performance buoyancy or perfect buoyancy, depending on what agency you're with, a, a bit of a hard time. But having a hired instructor that actually knows what they're doing with buoyancy, uh, which again, sometimes even experienced people don't have the best buoyancy. They, they think they do, but they don't. Um, but having that person that's like dedicated to just sitting there and ferrying weights back and forth and can help you set up like, you know, a platform with like different weights that you can try things like, you know, picking up a five pound weight off of a platform and take a big inhale as you do to lift it up off the platform. And then when you set the weight back down, start to exhale or, you know, release a little bit of air from your BCD before you let go of that weight. And when you let it go, you'll notice your buoyancy change again, right? And you wanna to try to catch it as best as possible. And just little tips and training techniques like that or things that you'll do in like buoyancy workshops that other agencies do uh, as like kind of a special affinity, affinity type thing. It's not like one of the main agencies necessarily or like a main workshop. Uh, and it's actually something that I'm looking to do as well. So if you're interested in any type of like private coaching on like a buoyancy workshop or something like that, um, I haven't started the program just yet, but uh, I am looking for people that are interested to kind of get some feedback and testimony and stuff like that before I, I kind of build out a full program for it. So if that's something you're interested, send me an email at training at circlehscuba.com training at circlehscuba.com. I'll have it down below. Uh, and just let me know that you're interested in that. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll ask a few different questions and stuff like that. And, and when we're ready, uh, we can set up a little training workshop type thing virtually. Uh, it will require you to film yourself underwater so I can see and give feedback. Um, but then, you know, we'll kind of go through a little exercise or two. And again, for the first few people, I'm mostly just going to be gathering testimony feedback uh, and improving the program. And then when it gets to a certain point, we'll probably actually launch it into a course that'll sell or like an offering where it's like private coaching for buoyancy improvements, that type of thing. Now, I know there's a lot involved in getting just your weighting correct, let alone all the trim pieces and things like that. So for that reason, I definitely recommend you always log your dives after you're done for the day. So whether that's a paper log like, you know, we used to do or, or some people still do today, or just like some type of digital log that you have, or maybe just some note app or something like that that you're using, you want to take note of what equipment you were using, because again, equipment, including the exposure suit, can change your buoyancy characteristics. If it's a personal private log, you might even want to put things like how much you weighed that day, you know, or how much you've been weighing generally in uh, recent times since we kind of fluctuate a little bit too, right? I also like to put things like the temperature of the water just because I feel like on colder days, I might bundle up a little bit more or, you know, I might've ate a little bit more the night before or something like that. So depending on how kind of hardcore you want to get, those are extra things you can log. Uh, but knowing not just how much weight, which is what most people record, if they're, if they're going to record it at all, they just kind of put the total weight. But where that weight was placed around your body on the BCD or on your back plate and wing is really important. Over time, as you continue to dive, and especially if you're diving more often, it'll be easier and easier to kind of make a guesstimate of how much weight you need to start with based off the gear and equipment that you're using. Now, I do know that calculating and kind of making an estimate of how much weight you need as a beginner, especially, can be really difficult. So as I promised at the beginning of the video, I did write a special tool just for you that helps you with calculating your weight, basically, and getting that initial estimate. On my website, circlehscuba.com, you'll see a resources tab in the menu at the top. And then under that, there is gonna be a scuba weight calculator for you to use. My disclaimer is that it really is more of a estimator than a calculator, but 
most people aren't looking for estimators, they're looking for calculators instead. So I called it a calculator, but it's more of an estimate, right? You still need to go through this proper weight check. It's just gonna give you a rough starting point. And that starting point is gonna be based off of the patty weighting guidelines. So the most recent guidelines say different things like take you know 10% of your body weight when you have a three millimeter exposure suit and things like that. But rather than memorizing all those guidelines, I just made a easy calculator that you can bookmark. It'll work on your phone, it'll work on desktop. So you know whether you're on your laptop or you just save the page and bookmark it on your phone, that's totally fine. But you know, as a starting point, it's a good calculator that again, you can just bookmark on your phone, pull it up when you're at the dive site. And it's probably one of those top questions I hear on a dive trip is you hear a diver, they're like, oh, you know, I've been diving for about six months or I haven't been diving for a few years. Like how much weight do you think I need? Right? Like that's literally one of the number one questions that any dive operator is going to hear. So bookmark this page. Again, it's under the resources section at circlehscuba.com. Now, if you want to learn more about using that calculator properly and just more about proper weight placement and trim and, you know, kind of creative ways that you can place weight around your body, then click or tap the screen now where I dive a little bit deeper into proper weighting, trim, and again, how to use that calculator. With that, stay safe, have fun, and let's go diving.